Everyone, let's welcome Rushi, Rushi Varsny for internationalization and localization done right. Hi there. Hi, I'm Ruchi Varshney, and I'm a software engineer at Hearsay Social. Uh, Hearsay Social is an enterprise social sales and marketing SaaS platform, and we're based in the city, so if you ever see us in the expo hall, you should come check us out. Quick overview. So I'm going to be covering internationalization and localization today. And I'll also try to bring up some testing and maintenance techniques and some tips and gotchas around this so that you don't waste a bunch of time and don't end up with situations like that. So the terms internationalization and localization are often confused for each other. Um, internationalization is essentially the process of preparing your application to handle multiple languages, while localization is the process of adding a particular language locale file to your application so you can be prepared for a particular language. So for instance, if you add a German translation file to your application, that's when you're localized for German. So you really cannot localize your application if you don't internationalize it. So why go through all this trouble? Clearly, you need to support an od international audience. Um, so if you often go through your analytics, you'll be surprised to see how many people who are non-native uh, English speakers come to your website and are never served in a language that works for them. So how many of you have actually tried to internationalize your Python applications? And how many of you did it from day one? Well, hopefully after this talk, you'll be convinced that you really should start it from, from day one. And it's really easy process to continue and maintain. And also that it'll actually help you drive some really good code practices. So international, internationalization of Python source templates and JavaScript. So that's, that's what you're gonna be working on. So the GetText module is in Python is essentially the baseline of all internationalization in Python. It is really just a wrapper around the GNU uh, GetText catalog API, and essentially using this function in uh, your app in your in your Python source requires this package to be installed on all of your server machines. So if you're working with any sort of package management configuration like Chef or Puppet, you want to add GetText to that. So the use of the GetText module is pretty straightforward. Uh, Django provides a really simple wrapper around the GetText functions that Python provides. So you simply import this from the utils uh, translation uh, package in Django. And you, you, you should be importing the uGetText function because it helps support Unicode strings. And given that Python 3 is going to be all Unicode, that's probably what you should be using. You also want to watch for the use of named arguments in your string interpolation. Um, this is because when you get translated strings, the, the context contextual placement of these, of these arguments in your string uh, can really differ. So for instance, in some languages, they might put the day before the month. So you really want to handle that by using named interpolation. Also, if you're handling uh, pluralized strings, you use another function called the UN get text function, and that basically takes in a singular form of the string, a plural form, along with a count that helps determine which string to show. If you're working with uh, Django templates, you still need to internationalize all your strings that appear there as well. So Django is really nice and it provides a trans and a block trans tag for your templates, which you can use for internationalization. The trans tag can handle very simple string literals, so it doesn't really handle any template variables. Uh, it's just for simple strings. The block trans tag, on the other hand, can handle lots of variables. And also the thing you have to watch for here is that you have to make sure that any HTML that comes in the translation block is actually included in the same translation block. You don't want to really translate just click or just the item inside the link. You want to translate the whole block because when you get the translated string back, that positioning can change. Also, if you're working with a pluralized string in a template file, you just ha you have to add on the plural tag and then split out all the strings that uh, need to be shown for singular and plural form, and then add on a count so that you know which one to show. 
So that, that was basically how we handled all the strings. But we need to show dates and numbers in a format that works for a particular locale. So PyBabel is a great package that you can install for uh, standard date and number formatting. And it's very simple to use. You just simply import dates and numbers and then simply call in the format date time function. And that takes in a simple date time object, a locale, and even handles time zones. So you can see that the output is string for German time in PST looks something like that. And there are different formats you can handle. So it's like a full form, or a long, or short form. And it's really great at handling all of that for you. Even for the numbers, you just call in format decimal, and all of your decimal numbers get converted, all of your decimal points get converted to commas so that it's appropriate for a German locale, for instance. So great, so we did a lot of the server side handling, but now we have to work with our client side JavaScript as well. But the problem is that JavaScript doesn't really support get text or an end get text function in the normal browser situation. So how do we get this file back in a way that we can actually make calls with end get text and get text in our JavaScript environment? So Django is really good about that too. It actually provides a view endpoint which you can call for getting a JS library file, which essentially defines the ngetText interpolate functions for you. And interpolate is essentially the same way as you would do standard uh, string interpolation in Python. You just pass in arguments, and you, you name the arguments, as I mentioned before. So it really works well. And if you're working with any sort of JavaScript widgets, like say, for instance, the jQuery date time picker, you can actually pass in uh, get texted strings to the date time picker so that it, for, it, it actually shows up in an internationalized format. So that really handles all of your client side needs as well. So once you've internationalized all of your source and handled all the JavaScript, you really need to tell your server how to detect locale. And Django is really good with this too. It actually gives you a locale middleware class that does all of the locale detection for you. Um, middleware, if you're not familiar with, is essentially a piece of software that runs on every single request to your web server. So the Django locale middleware just simply goes through different uh, parameters of your request to determine what language to activate. It'll first look at the Django language session key, uh, and it'll look for any locale that's available in that request session. And if it's not, then it actually falls back to the Django language cookie that may be set in your browser. Failing that, it actually will look at the accept language header in your, brow in your request, which is essentially set by your browser with your language preferences uh, in order of priority. And if none of these parameters are set, it actually falls back to your language code, which you've, de which you've defined in your Django settings file. But say, for instance, you save user preferences in your database. So you actually make sure that I, I as a user, can save a preference of, say, French, even though I have my browser set to Spanish as a default. All you do is you write your own little layer of middleware that runs after the locale middleware. So you can just simply override the Django session key with the user's preference. And from that point on, the person, even with a Spanish browser setting, will see all of your website in French just because they said that they wanted to. So this, is, this basically wraps up internationalization. And if you don't have any immediate localization needs, this is all you need to do. When, when the time comes to localize, you just go through the next process. But then do, just preparing your app for internationalization from the start is a lot easier than you think. So the localization process, um, I, I use the Babel package to do this. And it begins with your internationalized source files. So you start off with that. And then you run it through an extraction process that, it, that essentially rips out all the strings that were marked with get text in your source and puts it into a message catalog file that uh, is also known as a PO file. So the PO stands for a portable object file, which is essentially machine independent format. So it's just a text file in, in, in the sense of the word. 
You then pass this file off to your translation service, and then you get back a translated PO file, which you then use to initialize or update your Django app message catalog. So from that point on, your, your Django app is aware of all the new strings that came back in a translated form. And you run a compile. So the compile basically makes it a machine object where it's just an efficient binary for your website or any of your get text calls to work. And then it shows up on your website. So if you're using vanilla Django, so if you're using you know, Django's, uh, Django stack, Django templates, and you, you just stick with the vanilla Django install. Django actually provides a make messages utility that does all of this extraction for you. Um, but we, as a company, decided to use Jinja 2 as a templating system. And if you're using any other micro framework like Flask and you, you choose to use Jinja 2, then you need a Babel uh, extraction process because it can handle all of the extraction across the board and is not very Django specific. So the pybabel extract command just takes in a mapping file. And this mapping file is essentially a list of file extensions, and it maps it to a particular uh, extraction function that Babel provides. So you can see here my Python files are mapped to the extract Python function in Babel. And what it'll do is it'll just statically run through all the files and ex execute that function whenever it encounters a get text f uh, string. Also, you, if you notice here, um, I haven't really shown the JavaScript extension because, I mean, I just mentioned that we could do get text in our JavaScript files, but there's a reason for that. The JavaScript strings are essentially, uh, they need to be extracted in a different domain. This is because your server-side your server -side code is actually sending in the JavaScript strings from the server to the client, and if you really need to, you really need to optimize the number of strings that are being sent from the server side to the client side. And this is why you want to make sure that you're only extracting the JavaScript side strings in the in the process, and make sure only those strings are passed along from the server side. So the extract command looks exactly the same. You just add on the JavaScript uh, extraction function, and this can be a really great way to ensure that your JavaScript strings are also being extracted. Once you've extracted these strings, you'll notice that you get a PO file as an output. And this is what it looks like. It essentially contains a key value mapping of the string that you had get texted and an empty string. So this is empty right now because it hasn't been translated yet. So this is the part where the translation service comes in and populates your message string. You'll also notice that there's line numbers and file names, so you can always look back where these strings came from. The translation process comes next. So great, you extracted your your PO file, and now you have to pass it along to the translation service to actually get back your translation. So the message, the, the, the translation service just fills out the message string portion of your PO file and then sends it back to you. Now that you got your translations back, as I mentioned before, you need to install this into your Django application. And you simply use the pybabel init or update. So if this is your first time getting your translations back, you need to initialize. Otherwise, from that point on, you just use the update command. And the, there's, a, there's this part which explains the domain. And the domain is essentially uh, d delineating between the server-side domain and the client-side domain. So you have to run this, f this command twice to install your server-side uh, strings and your client-side strings. Then the catalog is just compiled into the machine binary, and you just run this through the pybabel compi compile command, and you'll see that it comes out as an MO file. And from that point on, your website is ready to show translated strings. So up next is some t testing and maintenance. So great, this is a very scalable process, and you'll see that just by enabling a simple locale, a, a simple test locale in your Django app, you can really do some re uh, some extensive testing around your translations. So there's this extra external package called PodPy, 
which is a really great package to generate test translations. So all you have to do is enable a test locale in your Django settings file, and you can make sure to, uh, you can always ensure that those test locales are only available in your de development environment. So you simply run a podpy command uh, to generate a bunch of test translations, and you can see that it found some Unicode equivalent strings for my uh, message strings. And then when I run through the standard process of compiling and adding this to my Django app config, I see that it shows up like this on my website. So you can really go and test this to a really great extent because now if I, for instance, missed a bunch of get text calls in my, uh, in my source code, you'll see it immediately because you will see uh, them, you, don't want, you will basically not see any funky characters on your website. Also, you can also watch for some of the fixed bit div problems that you'll have. So things will wrap around, and you can really catch these things before you send out, say, German translations in a production environment. A word on working with translation services. So this is really one part of your application that depends on third-party integration. So there's a lot of file transfers, API integrations, a lot of PM work that gets involved. So you have to watch out for that. You have to be prepared for that. Also, there's a problem of latency. So you must, be, you must be really good at deploying features at a really fast rate. But then you're always bottlenecked by this problem of not getting translations back. So the only way to counter this, perhaps, is to just make sure that your features are enabled at a locale level. Um, you could also try using some intermediate translations with Google APIs, but we haven't had much luck with that. Also, there's the, the, the problem of, it, of this stuff costing quite a bit. Um, you have to watch for this concept of translation memory. So translation memory essentially is a promise that, that's made by the translation service to not charge you for translations of the same string twice. So this may happen if you first have a string in your application and you decide to remove it and then reintroduce it. Um, and in the meanwhile, your translations went to the service twice, and they could basically charge you for the same string translation twice. So you have to ensure that there's mechanisms and checks around this thing. Also, you can see that since there's some PM uh, involvement in the whole process, there's some fixed costs involved. So this generally scales a lot better when you have more and more locales to translate. So here are some tips and tricks to watch for, essentially to make sure that you're getting some good translations back. And a lot of problems that I could find solutions for, especially while working with Babel packages. One thing I cannot stress enough is just add some comments for translators. This can really, really go a long way in getting some good translations back from translators, especially if strings are ambiguous. So in my example here, you'll see that I want a translation for a date fruit, but not a calendar date. So if I didn't have a comment in there, the, the translator may assume that it's a calendar date, and then my translation would be inappropriate. And you can really extract these comments and put them in the PO file by just adding the add comments option in your extraction, in your extraction uh, uh, command line call. And you'll see that in your PO file, that, that comment shows up. And I also show an example of how to do this in your templates. The templates provide a comment, an end comment tag to do this. But say, for instance, I needed to show date in two different contexts in my application. So I have a date fruit and I have a calendar date. And I want both the strings to show up in my application, but in different contexts. So here's where the pget text call comes really handy. Um, the pget text call essentially takes in another parameter that helps you distinguish between uh, two situations that have the same string, and you just pass in a message context. If you had gone with a normal you get text call, the date string would have been merged into one entry in your PO file. But over here, you can see that with the, with the addition of the message context field, you can get two separate entries and they'll be distinguished in your PO file. We also had some trouble working with custom template tags. 
So you can always, you, you may define your own template tags in your file and Babel needs to be essentially notified of these external tags because if it was, if, if, it, if it doesn't know about these tags, it'll actually skip get text calls and you will not see trans, uh, extractions for the strings that are in those tags. So again, in your mapping file, which you pass into the extraction mechanism, you can just call in this extra extensions uh, option, and then you pass in all the different custom tags that you're using in your, in your templates so that Babel knows that it has to extract these things. There's also an idea around lazy translations. So when you're working, when, when the server is initializing, there's no concept of a locale. Um, the locale is only known when a request comes in. So if you have certain constants or model field definitions defined, and these things run at initialization, a normal you get text call wouldn't know what to return. It'll just return an, an English string for an English string coming in. So to, basically to enable something that helps mark a string as a candidate for translation, but not immediately. There's this concept of a you get text lazy call. And what it does is that it makes the translated string a lazy reference that is evaluated later on when your request comes in. So for instance, it'll get evaluated when I'm doing template rendering. And you have to really make sure that you use this in a, in a way that your model initialization can show really good translations. But there's a catch with using lazy translations. Lazy translations are essentially lazy objects. They're, they're proxy objects. They really don't know how to trans translate to byte string. So if you're doing any sort of string concatenation or interpolation with, with the lazy objects, they might not work as you expect them to. Also, if you're doing any sort of JSON encoding of these strings, you have to make sure that there's a mechanism to force these objects to go to their string form when they're going for uh, JSON encoding. And there's something called a lazy encoder that Django provides uh, in, in their serialization uh, section on the documentation. There's also import aliases. So sometimes we really like putting some shorthand in our code for long function names. Again, one of these is one, this is one of those things because Babel really statically runs through all of your files to get all the strings. Um, you really have to make sure that PyBabel knows of your, your lazy references or your aliases in a keyword option in the extraction mechanism. So I talked about JavaScript internationalization. I said that there was a Django view function that you could call to make sure that JavaScript uh, uh, get text calls are enabled. But the issue is that that JavaScript view really just returns a standard output each time you call it. And since it's a view function, you'll be making that request every, uh, you'll be calling that view every time you make a request to your web server. That's kind of not performant at all. It makes a really good candidate for caching just because it'll just return the same output each time you call it. So there's, a, there's one thing you could do is there's an option to cache the output of this view function in, in the latest version of Django. But one thing you could do before you use that is just pre-generate this call. So you just make a call to it and, return, and save the output in a se separate JavaScript file that you can serve statically later on. So last but not least, there's the idea of database strings. So the problem with database strings is that you really need to save only user-generated content in your database. Otherwise, you really, you'll end up adding language tracking in your database, which is really non-performant and is really a pain to deal with. So all you need to do is to avoid using database strings other than user-generated content is to define enumerations for, your, uh, for the strings that you want to show in your application. Um, just using enums will obviously make your database query super quick, not, and, and it'll also save you a bunch of space. So if you need any sort of display strings for all your enumerations, you can define a, a cooler enum class, a rich enum class, that really maps your enum to a get text string that you can show in your templates and other situations where you need to show things. But if you're in a situation where you really have to get your database strings translated, 
You can use this package called the Django DB get text uh, package to make, essentially what it'll do is it'll, it'll load up your model strings into the translation PO file that you'll ship off for translation and then you can reinstall them back. So here are some takeaways. Babel and PodPy can really provide some powerful internationalization tools. Um, and especially if you, uh, with support for JavaScript internationalization, you can get your mobile applications working really well with all of this internationalization infrastructure. And hopefully, by the end of this, I've really convinced you that you should internationalize early and make sure that your application is ready to localize from day one. Here's some other resources I found useful. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach me at any of these sources or, and the slides are up on PyCon 180N. Thanks. We'll have five minutes of QA if anyone has any questions. There's a microphone right here in the center if that is the case. Also, the closing ceremonies are at 310 in this room. As you can see, people are arriving here for it and we've been told that you want to be here. Is that microphone on? Doesn't seem to, ah, now it is. Um, so you mentioned you have the different contexts for date, the date string, for example. Right. Um, and you could have duplicates if you didn't have that. Yeah. Is there some sort of warning mechanism that tells you you have duplicate text strings when you're? Um, no, because in, in the view of just the you get text call, that'll appear as the same string. So it'll actually get, it'll get mapped to the same ID in your PO file. So the only way to make sure that your, hmm. I mean, you can always test your translations with, uh, a, you'll notice it in your UI, but right. after that point, you really have to just use the PCAT text, PCAT right. text call. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question, and uh, just for anyone's benefit, a couple small uh, corrections slash recommendations. Sure. Um, firstly, um, do you know uh, what's up with um, en versus en dash us in Django? The capital lang info uh, uh, list of dictionaries does not have en dash us, and that causes some bugs for some people. But as you r recommended, your locale should be en dash us, and that kind of caused us some interesting problems recently. Okay. Oh. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, when I tried it out, I don't think we ran into that issue, but maybe I should look back at our settings file, and we might have just used en. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure. Actually, I think maybe in the latest version of Django, they, they made a workaround for that. Perhaps. Um, just the, the small uh, corrections. Uh, first, you said the trans tags doesn't handle variables. If you put in a single variable without any expressions in it, it should work, I think. OK. Uh, the, the, the trans tag by itself. Also, for um, the Django session uh, key setter, there's actually a built-in view for that. So that might be a better way to handle oh, that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, finally, for translation, if you um, if you're doing in-house translation, like if you have somebody in your, as part of your team, you should ch check out a service called TransFX. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a lot of warts, but it's kind of a lifesaver. It's much better than having them edit the .po files. That's, there's no way that would work out unless they're very computer savvy. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Hey, uh, actually, I had a question before the presentation, but you answered it within the presentation, okay. so it was so awesome. I came here to thank you. Okay, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you could speak about the translation services or service you used and make yeah, any sure. recommendations. Um, so yeah, uh, as uh, as, he, as somebody mentioned up front, there's trans effects you can work with. Uh, we personally work with uh, LineBridge. Uh, so they said we said we basically FTP our files over to them and get the translations back and integrate them into our application. So they're a, they're a good service that we work with. Yeah. 
So, so I've noticed doing a set locale on the server side can be an incredibly heavyweight operation. I'd never used the Django APIs, but I was just looking at the Django source. It right. never, it seems it's careful never to call a full set locale, which means you can do translated strings, but you can't do number formatting. I'm curious if you have had any situations where you had to do set locale very quickly on the server to keep changing to answer requests in different languages and do different number formatting as opposed to just translations. Right, so one, one way is to handle that in the middleware. Uh, in the middleware, if you only set the Django language key when it's different from what, it's, what is expected, so you can ensure that you're not constantly setting the locale on every, requ every request that goes right. through the middleware, um, that's an option. But there's also the activate function in uh, the Django uh, utils translation package, and the activate basically just temporarily activates a different locale, lets your uget text calls load a different uh, translation, and then you can flip it back to what it originally was. So it's not really the set locale function. Right, but, but, but that all handles just translated strings. I'm more, I was asking about specifically formatting numbers and doing the other locale operations other than translation. Oh, um, that, that's where the PyBabel uh, functions come in, come really handy because the format date time will actually take in your, a locale as a string. You just pass in the string and it'll know what date time does to it, pop Does back. it call set locale underneath, do you know, or does it avoid that somehow? Um, I'm not entirely I'm sure. Okay, I thanks. don't think so, because okay. actually what it does, it is, it's referencing a, an XML file of standard definitions. So it, it's really just a static file that it's looking at for your translations. Yep. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much.